fairly profound happened this year, actually. If you look, in the beginning of the year, everybody has some attitude about AI. That attitude is generally, this is gonna be big, it's gonna be the future, and somehow, a few months ago, it kicked into turbocharge. And the reason for that is several things. The first is that we, in the last couple years, have figured out how to make AI much, much smarter. Rather than just pre-training, pre-training basically says, let's take all of, the, all of the information that humans have ever created, let's give it to the AI to learn from. It's essentially memorization and generalization. It's, no, it's not unlike going to school back when we were kids. The first stage of learning. Pre-training was never meant, just as preschool was never meant to be the end of education. Pre-training, preschool, was simply teaching you the basic skills of intelligence so that you can understand how to learn everything else. Without vocabulary, without understanding of language and how to communicate, how to think, it's impossible to learn everything else. The next is post-training. Post-training after pre-training is teaching you skills. Skills to solve problems, break down problems, reason about it, how to solve math problems, how to code, how to think about these problems step by step. Use first principle reasoning. And then after that is where computation really kicks in. As you know, for many of us, you know, we went to school, and that's, in my case, decades ago. But ever since, I've learned more, thought about more, and the reason for that is because we're constantly grounding ourselves in new knowledge, we're constantly doing research, and we're constantly thinking. Thinking is really what intelligence is all about. And so now we have three fundamental technology skills. We have these three technology, pre-training, which still requires enormous, enormous amount of computation. We now have post-training, which uses even more computation. And now thinking puts incredible amounts of computation load on the infrastructure because it's thinking on our behalf for every single human. So the amount of computation necessary for AI to think, inference, is really quite extraordinary. Now, I used to hear people say that inference is easy. NVIDIA should do training. NVIDIA is going to do, you know, they are really good at this, so they're going to do training. That inference was easy. How could thinking be easy? Regurgitating memorized content is easy. Regurgitating the multiplication table is easy. Thinking is hard, which is the reason why these three scales, these three new scaling laws, which is all of it in, in full steam, has put so much pressure on the amount of computation. Now, another thing has happened. From these three scaling laws, we get smarter models. And these smarter models need more compute. But when you get smarter models, you get more intelligence, people use it. As if anything happens, I want to be the first one out. Just kidding. I'm sure it's fine. Probably just lunch. My stomach. <clears throat> was that me? And so, so where was I? The smarter your models are, the smarter your models are, the more people use it. It's now more grounded. It's able to reason. It's able to solve problems it never learned how to solve before because it could do research. Go learn about it, come back, break it down, reason about how to solve your, how to answer your question how to solve your problem, and go off and solve it. The amount of thinking is making the models more intelligent. The more intelligent it is, the more people use it. The more intelligent it is, the more computation is necessary. But here's what happened. This last year, the AI industry turned a corner, meaning that the AI models are now smart enough, they're making, they're worthy, they're worthy to pay for it. NVIDIA pays for every license of Cursor, and we gladly do it. We gladly do it because Cursor is helping a several hundred thousand dollar employee software engineer or AI researcher be many, many times more productive. So of course we'd be more than happy to do that. These AI models have become good enough that they are worthy to be paid for. Cursor, Eleven Labs, Synthesia, Abridge, open evidence, the list goes on. Of course, open AI, 
of course, Claude, these models are now so good that people are paying for it. And because people are paying for it and using more of it, and every time they use more of it, you need more compute, we now have two exponentials. These two exponentials, one is the exponential compute requirement of the three scaling law. And the second exponential, the more people, the smarter it is, the more people use it, the more people use it, the more computing it needs. Two exponentials now putting pressure on the world's computational resource. At exactly the time when I told you earlier that Moore's law has largely ended. And so the question is, what do we do? If we have these two exponential demands growing, and if we don't, if we don't find a way to drive the cost down, then this positive feedback system, this circular feedback system, essentially called the virtuous cycle, essential for almost any industry, essential for any platform industry. It was essential for NVIDIA. We have now reached the virtuous cycle of CUDA. The more applications, the more, uh, the more applications people create, the more valuable CUDA is, the more valuable CUDA is, the more CUDA computers are purchased, the more CUDA per computers are purchased, more developers want to create applications for it. That virtual cycle for NVIDIA has now been achieved after 30 years. We have achieved that also. 15 years later, we've achieved that for AI. AI has now reached the virtual cycle. And so the more you use it, because the AI is smart and we pay for it, the more profit is generated, the more profit generated, the more compute's put to, on, the, on the grid, the more compute is put into AI factories, the more compute, the AI becomes smarter, the smarter, more, more people use it, the more applications use it, the more problems we can solve. This virtual cycle is now spinning. What we need to do is drive the cost down tremendously so that one, the user experience is better when you prompt the AI, it responds to you much faster. And two, so that we keep this virtual cycle going by driving its cost down so that it could get smarter, so that more people use it, so that so on and so forth. That virtual cycle is now spinning. But how do we do that when Moore's Law has really reached this limit? Well, the answer is called co-design. You can't just design chips and hope that things on top of it is gonna go faster. The best you could do in designing chips is add, I don't know, 50% more transistors every couple of years. And if you added more transistors, just, you know, we can add more transistors and TSMC's got a lot of transistor, incredible company. We just keep adding more transistors. However, that's all in percentages, not exponentials. We need to compound exponentials to keep this virtual cycle going. We call it extreme co-design. NVIDIA is the only company in the world today that literally starts from a blank sheet of paper and can think about new fundamental architecture, computer architecture, new chips, new systems, new software, new model architecture, and new applications all at the same time. So many of the people in this room are here because you're different parts of that layer, that different parts of that stack and working with NVIDIA. We fundamentally re-architect everything from the ground up. And then, because AI is such a large problem, we scale it up. We created a whole computer, a computer for the first time that has scaled up into an entire rack. That's one computer, one GPU. And then we scale it out by inventing a new AI Ethernet technology we call Spectrum X Ethernet. Everybody will say Ethernet's Ethernet. Ethernet's hardly Ethernet. Ethernet, Spectrum X Ethernet, is designed for AI performance, and it's the reason why it's so successful. And even that's not big enough. We'll fill this entire room of AI supercomputers and GPUs. That's still not big enough because the number of applications and the number of users for AI is continuing to grow exponentially, and we connect multiple of these data centers together, and we call that scale across, Spectrum XGS. Gigascale, X, Spectrum X Gigascale, XGS. By doing so, we do co-design at such, a, such an enormous level, such an extreme level, that the performance benefits are shocking. Not 50% better each generation, not 25% better each generation, but much, much more. This is, 
the most extreme co-designed computer we've ever made, and quite frankly, made in modern times. Since the IBM System 360, I don't think a computer has been ground up, reinvented like this ever. This system was incredibly hard to create. I'll show you the benefits in just a second. But essentially what we've done, essentially what we've done, we've created otherwise, hey Janine, you can come out. It's, you, have to, you have to meet me like halfway. All right, so this is kind of like Captain America Shield. So NVLink 72, NVLink 72, if we were to create one giant chip, one giant GPU, this is what it would look like. This is the level of wafer scale processing we would have to do. It's incredible. All of this, all of these chips are now put into one giant rack. Did I do that or did somebody else do that? Into that one giant rack. You know, sometimes I don't feel like I'm up here by myself. <laughs> this one giant rack makes all of these chips work together as one. It's actually completely incredible. And I'll show you the benefits of that. The way it looks is this. So, thanks, Janine. I, I like this. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Janine Paul. I got it. In the future, next I'm just gonna go like Thor. It's like when you're at home and, and you can't reach the remote and you just go like this and somebody brings it to you. That's, yeah, same idea. It never happens to me, I'm just dreaming about it. I'm just saying. Okay, so, so anyhow, anyhow, um, we basically, this is what we created in the past. This is NVLink MV Link 8. Now, these models are so gigantic the way we solve it is we turn this model, this gigantic model, into a whole bunch of experts. It's a little bit like a team. And so these experts are good at certain types of problems. And we collect a whole bunch of experts together. And so this giant multi-trillion dollar AI model has all these different experts, and we put all these different experts on the GPU. Now, this is NVLink 72. We can put all of the chips into one giant fabric and every single expert can talk to each other. So the master, the, the primary expert, could talk to all of the distributed work and all of the necessary context and prompts and bunch of data that we have to, bunch of tokens that we have to send to all of the experts. The experts would, whichever one of the experts are selected to solve the answer, would then go off and try to respond. And then it would go off and do that layer after layer after layer. Sometimes eight, sometimes 16 and sometimes these experts, sometimes 64, sometimes 256, but the point is there are more and more and more experts. Well, here, MVLink 72, we have 72 GPUs, and because of that, we could put four experts in one GPU. The most important thing you need to do for each GPU is to generate tokens, which is the amount of bandwidth that you have in HBM memory. We have one, H one GPU, generating thinking for four experts. Versus here, because each one of the computers can only put eight GPUs, we have to put 32 experts into one GPU. So this one GPU has to think for 32 experts versus this system, each GPU only has to think for four. And because of that, the speed difference is incredible. And this just came out, this is the benchmark done by semi-analysis, they do a really, really thorough job, and they benchmarked all of the GPUs that are benchmarkable, and it turns out it's not that many. If you look at the list of, looks, <laughs> list of GPUs you could actually benchmark, is like 90% NVIDIA, okay? And, but, so we're comparing ourselves to ourselves, but the second best GPU in the world is the H200 and runs all the workload. Grace Blackwell, per GPU, is 10 times the performance. Now, how do you get 10 times the performance when it's only twice the number of transistors? Well, the answer is extreme co-design. 
And by understanding the nature of the future of AI models, and we're thinking across that entire stack, we can create architectures for the future. This is a big deal. It says we can now respond a lot faster, but this is an even bigger deal. This next one, look at this. This says that the lowest cost tokens in the world are generated by Grace Blackwell and VLink72, the most expensive computer. On the one hand, GB200 is the most expensive computer. On the other hand, its token generation capability is so great that it produces it at the lowest cost because the tokens per second divided by the, t by the total cost of ownership of Grace Blackwell is so good. It is the lowest cost way to generate tokens. By doing so, delivering incredible performance, 10 times the performance, delivering 10 times lower cost, that virtual cycle can continue. Which then brings me to this one, I just saw this literally yesterday. This is uh, the CSP CapEx. People are asking me about CapEx these days. And um, this is a good way to look at it. In fact, the CapEx of the top six CSPs, and this one, this one is uh, Amazon, CoreWeave, Google, Meta, Microsoft, and Oracle. Okay, these CSPs together are going to invest this much in CapEx. And I would, I would tell you, the timing couldn't be better. And the reason for that is now we have the Grace Blackwell and VLink 72 in all volume production, supply chain, everywhere in the world is manufacturing it. So we can now deliver to all of them this new architecture so that the CapEx invests in instruments, computers, that deliver the best TCO. Now, underneath this, there are two things that are going on. So when you look at this, it's actually fairly extraordinary. It's fairly extraordinary anyhow. But what's happening under, underneath is this. There are two platform shifts happening at the same time. One platform shift is going from general purpose computing to accelerated computing. Remember, accelerated computing, as I mentioned to you before, it does data processing, it does image processing, computer graphics, it does comp computation of all kinds. It runs SQL, runs Spark, it runs, you know, you, you ask it, you tell us what you need to have run, and I'm fairly certain we have an amazing library for you. You could be, you know, a data center trying to make masks to manufacture semiconductors. We have a great library for you. And so underneath, irrespective of AI, the world is moving from general purpose computing to accelerated computing, irrespective of AI. And in fact, many of the CSPs already have services that have been here long ago before AI. Remember, they were invented in the era of machine learning, classical machine learning algorithms like XGBoost, algorithms like um, uh, data frames that are used for recommender systems, collaborative filtering, content filtering. All of those technologies were created in the old days of general purpose computing. Even those algorithms, even those architectures are now better with accelerated computing. And so even without AI, the world's CSPs are going to invest into acceleration. NVIDIA's GPU is the only GPU that can do all of that plus AI. And ASIC might be able to do AI, but it can't do any of the others. NVIDIA could do all of that, which explains why it is so safe to just lean into NVIDIA's architecture. We have now reached our virtual cycle our inflection point. And this is quite extraordinary. I have many partners in the room, and all of you are part of our supply chain, and I know how hard you guys are working. I wanna thank all of you, how hard you are working. Thank you very much.